Haugel slips out of a few tackles, and Peter Haugel left for the races. I'll do it up for the team. And sheds the first defender, sheds the second defender. Busts it open. Jack Smith down the right sideline and into the end zone. Halloween may be next week, but nothing scary. In fact, everything joyous about high school football. Welcome to Varsity Sports Live. I'm David Brown, alongside the Jandy Man, Jason Andera. All the quarterfinal action is finally complete in both North and South Dakota, and uh, we have a lot of interesting results across the yeah, state. Yeah, South Dakota, of course, took place Thursday last night, uh, but we're going to hope to give you that extra layer of information. Um, if you're tuning in, you, maybe you've seen some of these results or highlights, but we hope to get you totally ready for semifinal action with tons of information tonight. Completely and totally ready. More information on this program than any other. Let's go. And that's a guarantee. We're going to start with highlights. Yes, the 5-4 matchup in 11 AAA. Sioux Falls, Jefferson, Brandon Valley. Opening drive for the Lynx all aboard the Gus bus. Gus Scott. How about that kid? Three weeks in a row has led the team in rushing. Doesn't matter who you plug in behind that great offensive line. 7 0 Brandon Valley early. Later in the first, Lynx drive it again in Gus. We trust. Second score of the game. Yeah, this guy, he's doing some of the work himself. He's getting some help, but uh, Brandon Valley taking control of this one early. Jefferson's not done, though. They try to respond. They move Thomas Heiberger under center. Oh, but there's a problem trying to hand off to Manny Schmaus. Brandon Valley recovers the fumble, and on the ensuing possession for the Lynx. They got a bunch of playmakers really stepping up down the switch. How about Devion Bonwell when he takes the pitch, finds some room, doesn't go down easy, keeps on trucking. Look at him go down inside the five yard line. Man, that is a man's run from Devion Bonwell witty and he would get rewarded on the very next play into the end zone. 21 nothing Brandon. Just a sophomore and this guy runs. He runs good routes, but he might run the ball even better. Credit to Sioux Falls Jefferson, though. They fought for the rest of the half. Davion Simonson punches it in for the Cavs to cut the deficit to 21 to 7. And then late in the first half, this is what we kind of wanted to see from Sioux Falls Jefferson. A little creativity as quarterback Ethan Swenson sneaks out of the backfield and gets the pass for the touchdown. Jefferson down 21 0. They got within 28 21, but the Lynx with some cushion in the second half, and they take this one 41 to 21. Good effort from Sioux Falls Jefferson, especially cutting it to a one score game late, but Brandon Valley just too much. Yeah, they were efficient. Gus Scott gave him 100 yards for the third game in a row, and they are marching on to the semis. 41 21, the final of the four over the five seed. And tonight, yes, this game happening tonight because Rapid City Stevens had a little trouble with the weather getting out to the east side of the state. But it is Sioux Falls Lincoln, the number one seed, 56 21, the sixth game in a row of at least 55 points for this unstoppable Patriot offense. So they get to host once again. They get a rematch against Brandon Valley. Uh, we'll break that one down a little bit later in the show. Number one versus number four in one semifinal. On the other side of the bracket, Number seven, Sioux Falls, Washington, visiting number two, Harrisburg. This is just a three-point game in the regular season. But one reason for Harrisburg's improvement down the stretch, the running game, Josiah Hines, 25 yards. Yeah, he's been so good for them. And like I said earlier, having him run the ball helps free up Levi Danielson on defense. It's been a great, great trade-off. Warriors trying to find some offense, but some nine-on-nine -nine crime. Tommy Hoffman sacked by Sam Just. Tigers up 7-0 after one. Second quarter, Sam Knuth to old reliable Titan try on 37 yards. 14-0 Harrisburg, and the route was on at that point. The Tigers reach the semifinals for the fourth straight season. 42-7 is your final score over Washington. Tigers once again in the semifinals. Yeah, and they found Max Carlson for a couple catches. They found Titan Tryon. He only needed three catches. And, of course, Hines was big with those 93 yards. Tigers did what they need. Get out of this one. They're not hurt, and now they get to see the next team on this list. Yes, if you look at the bottom there, you see that versus next. So a little bit of a spoiler alert before we go into our last quarterfinal in 11 AAA. It is number six, Sioux Falls Roosevelt, and number three, O'Gorman. Third and long for the Knights early. Aiden Gruse finds Maverick Jones on the screen. He rumbles into the Roosevelt red zone to keep the drive alive. And then just a few plays later, it is Ryland Satter. Some nifty moves as he finds his way to the end zone and for a 7-0 lead. So good to see Ryland Satter 
you know, back and f fully healthy again this week, and he is uh, definitely going to be a weapon. Roosevelt trying to respond. Watch Jackson Graven good. As slippery as the weather on Thursday, eluding three tacklers, changing directions. He gets a nice game to keep the Rough Riders in business, and it would pay off just a short time later. Jackson Brower will eventually find Graven good in the end zone. Roosevelt kept it close early. Jandy stayed competitive throughout. But in the end, it is O'Gorman with the 46 to 27 victory. They will meet Harrisburg in the semifinals for the second straight season. The Tigers won at McEnany Field last season in the semifinals. Knights looking to win a road game in this year's semifinals. Yeah, that's been a kind of a tradition over the last several seasons. You're going to see Harrisburg and O'Gorman square off once again in the playoffs. Moving on down to Class 11 AA, the 5-4 matchup featured Aberdeen Central visiting Watertown. Just a two-point game between these two squads in the regular season. Golden Eagles up 3-0 midway through the first. Arrows in punt formation on 4th and 11, but it's a fake. Spencer Winches to Marcus Pitkin. He does the rest. 53 yards. Pitkin just a sophomore. He does a little work on his own, but they knew that was wide open, and they had a punt blocked before that happened. So. They were lucky to get out of that one alive. 7-3 Watertown at that point. 14-3 in the second. Aberdeen Central response. How about the big man, Bryce Beidelspacher? Any touchdown by a man wearing number 70 yeah. is a treat. That cuts the lead to 14-10. But on the ensuing drive for the Watertown Arrows, they rely on old reliable Juven Hudson. Yeah, this man can run, and uh, you can see he does a lot of this on his own. A lot of times he's untouched, but this was a great run on his own. Another 100-yard game for the senior who leads uh, the team in touchdowns and in yards. It, it was 21-17 at halftime, but Watertown shuts out Aberdeen Central in the second half, 42-17 your final. Believe it or not, Watertown's first playoff win in almost 10 years. It was Halloween 2013. That was the last one. Head coach John Hodor knows what it means to both his players and the community to get this win. We got a win. First time we've had a big playoff win in a long, long time. Pretty exciting for us, and uh, now we got to enjoy this for the day, and then we have to move on. I mean, we can, we have a shot. We have a shot to go make some plays and uh, see what happens this coming week. And you got to be happy for Watertown, especially after all those years kind of struggling. They didn't know where they were in terms of classes when AAA four, and they were in AAA for a while, dropped down back to AA, and now they get their first playoff win in 10 years. Coach Hoderf gives a lot of credit to the strength and conditioning. They brought a new guy in. He's done a great job with that team, and they're able to play deeper into the playoffs now at a higher physical level. They're going to have to get even one more level up to play Pier next week. Yeah, let's get a look at the rest of the scores from the 11 AA quarterfinals, and it is the Pier Governors moving on. 49-26 over Spearfish. That game taking place Friday night, again, because of travel issues out west. So Pier, once again, in the semifinals, they will host Watertown in the 1-4 matchup. Yeah, a lot of those Govs got the second half off in this one, and the Spearfish scored a couple to make it look a little closer, but this was all Governors. The 7-2 matchup is a rematch of the regular season finale here on in Yankton. 17 nothing yanked to the final maybe a bit more low scoring than people would expect but also yanked to knowing how Huron plays how Huron operates and getting ready for the semifinals next week and Huron was much healthier coming into this but look at what the Yankton defense did they got their takeaways they got Lucas Kamshoff generating some offense and Yankton feeling good getting through 10 games. And a Friday night quarterfinal, Sturgis and T. It is the Titans moving on 39 to 13. More big games for the Titans on the running game. DeYoung, Brenner Conrad contributing to a big Titan victory. Yeah, hopefully DeYoung is okay. He started out great and uh, kind of left the game for a while, was banged up. Hopefully he can come back. But they have plenty of guys in that lineup to make a run at Yankton next week. So it'll be Pierre against Watertown and Yankton against T in the 11 AA semifinals. Moving to Class 11A, Del Rapids easily over Madison, 52 to nothing. Uh, you see the stat line for Jack Henry, one for one. Yeah. Doesn't help the average, but hey, it was a touchdown pass. 53 yards as Del Rapids moves on to the semifinals. West Central, the number two seed, they top Chamberlain the seven seed, 45 to 13. And once again, the Trojan running game doing what it does best. When you run the ball like that, you're not going to lose many games. West Central proving that they can do it on the ground. And so West Central will face the winner of Lennox versus Canton. It was a 28-20 game in favor of Canton in the regular season. 
but it's actually the Orioles who are up 6-0 in the first when the Seahawks respond. Kane Walner into the end zone. We're tied at six apiece. Kane Walner is such a tough runner, and on a night like this, you need tough guys like that. He got banged up a little bit later in this game as well. Lennox regains the lead a short time later. We know about their passing game. How about Tate Gertis on the ground finding some space? 21 yards, 14-6 Orioles, but that lead would only last a few seconds because on the ensuing kickoff, Matt Anderson starts left, spins out of a tackle, reverses field, won't be denied. 65 yards to the house. One of their more versatile players, great on defense, great on special teams, or as they call it, special forces in Canton. And uh, that was a huge boost to the Seahawks, but not much scoring after that. Late in the half, Walner would get in again for Canton. The Seahawks led 22-14 at the break, but the second half belonged to Lennox. They are going to get a touchdown pass late here from Boston Catzer to Drake Mickelson with less than a minute to go, Jandy. And the Orioles pull off the upset 28 to 22. A couple important things for Lennox here. They got a great night from Tate Gertis, the sophomore running back who is really starting to establish himself on the ground. And then Drake Mickelson, a couple of touchdown catches. catches. Yes, Porter Eden had a good game, but it wasn't all Porter Eden. They distributed the ball very well. So it will be Lennox against, against West Central in one semifinal. In a game that you saw right here on Midco Sports on Thursday night, number five, Dakota Valley visiting number four, Sioux Falls Christian. Fourth down early first quarter, Lincoln Prince with the rainbow to Cole Snyder, 40 yards, 7 nothing Chargers. He is such a special player and made it special. They got up 10 nothing quickly. It was 10 nothing when Jackson Boonstra would keep things close. Touchdown cuts at the 10-6 at the halftime break. And you see the rain and the mist coming in. It would intensify in the second half, but so would Boonstra. Here comes the boon. 59 yards, Dakota Valley takes the lead 13-10. What a spark plug, just a junior. Boonstra over 200 yards on the night, and they needed it at that point. The momentum fully behind the Panthers. Yes, but the Chargers with backup quarterback Cade Canyon Prince, he'd do his best relieving Lincoln. We went out with an arm injury. Snyder gets his second touchdown there, and then Braden Whitty will cap off the scoring with this 15-yard touchdown. And your final out at Bob Young Field is 24-14. Sioux Falls Christian for the second straight year beats Dakota Valley in the quarterfinals and for the second straight year they're going to face Del Rapids in the semifinals. It looked like it was slipping away with injuries and with the way the momentum switched but the Chargers able to get that back with the strong ground game from Johnny Skyberg and Braden Whitty. West Central Lennox in one semi Sioux Falls Christian Del Rapids in the other in 11B great and I mean great quarterfinal matchup between number six Hot Springs and number three Sioux Valley third play from scrimmage Braden Peterson takes it in for the Bison. Long run, 7 nothing visitors. You called this, Jandy. Sometimes you forget about Braden Peterson. Cameron Macheski's had such a fantastic year, but Braden Peterson made this his night. We're tied at 7 now when Colin Iverson dumps it off to the aforementioned Cameron Majeski, and he's going to do the rest into the end zone. 14-7 Hot Springs. Yeah, very physical team, and then when they get the lead, it's so hard to come back on them. They added another one. Second quarter, they keep their foot on the gas. Peterson with another touchdown. Cossacks try and stay in it. Brock Christofferson, 10 yards, but it's 28-13 Hot Springs at the break. It would stay that way until the fourth quarter when Braden Peterson gets his fourth touchdown. Yeah, this guy was not going to be stopped on this night. And again, the score looked a little inflated at the end. Sioux Valley hung in for a while, but they couldn't hang with the Hot Springs Bison, who now gets a host a next uh, semifinal game next round. Yeah, they go across the state and absolutely dominate Sioux Valley. 49 to 13 is your final. We heard from the victorious Bison afterwards. Excellent showing all three phases of the game. A um, little different than kind of what we expected. I think that early touchdown on that first drive was was kind of the took the wins out of their sail and uh, just just kept going from there. Uh, couldn't be more proud of this group, these, this coaching staff. Um, just an excellent, excellent night for us. And during the Football Insiders this week, you called this game. You forget Hot Springs, their only loss of the season to 11A Del Rapids. Kind of a giant that's been lurking all season and it showed out in the quarters. They have. They didn't get the seed points to back them up, but made that semifinal run last year. I think that helped with their confidence going into this year. And their offensive line almost all came back. And that's the part 
that really solidified them as another semifinal team this year. All right, they're off to the semifinals in 11B. Who will be joining them in the 11B semifinals? Well, the Winter Warriors, of course, 28-0 over Aberdeen Ron Colley. Another shutout for Winter. And they ran the ball hard. Aiden Barfus got a big run in that game, but otherwise it was just plugging along as usual as uh, the Winter Warriors, they're automatic. More scores in 11B. This was the big upset. Undefeated duel falls 13 to 8 to the 10 seed Rapid City Christian. The Comets get a goal line stand in the final seconds to preserve the victory. Yeah, it, this was close. This was undecided throughout. Wilson Kiefer came up with a big catch in that game. One of his two touchdowns as uh, the Kiefer's hooked up for the win. 13-8, your final there. And then another great battle, the defending state champions from Elk Point, Jefferson. They defeat Tri-Valley 14-7. They had to come back to win in the regular season. Exactly. They have to come back to win in the playoffs. Very, very similar to the way the first game played out. But Ashton Fairbanks ended up being the difference maker in this game. Returned to pick six as it was tied into the fourth quarter. And the Huskies, I mean, improbably get back to the final four. And it's going to be a championship rematch. Number four, Elk Point Jefferson against number one winner. And then Rapid City Christian and Hot Springs in the other semifinal in 11B. In the nine-man ranks, Hanson and Parkston met in a nine double-A quarterfinal. Like everywhere else on Thursday night, it was wet, rainy, playoff football weather all around. Parkston's up 2-0 after a safety. First play after the free kick, Braden Jervik slips through the left side. He's knocked out of bounds inside the 10, but just a few plays later, Jervik spinning his way across the play in five-yard score, 8-0 Trojans. So many different backs that they can attack you with. You almost forget they have one of the best in the class in Braden Jervik. After a Hanson punt, guess what? It is Jervik again slamming his way into the end zone, 14-0 Parkston. Again, you get a two-score lead, and you're a team that averages giving up 2.2 points per game. You're feeling pretty good at this point. Trojans defense was excellent per usual on Thursday night. Will Jadozi with a big hit. Parkson would have maintained that 14 0 lead at halftime. Third quarter, you've seen Jervik on offense. Uh, how about a little defense? He somehow gets the pick off the wet grass, and then he's feeling pretty good afterwards because he looks right at Tom Eamon and says, Are you not entertained? <laughs> You're entertained, Jandy Pants. Parkson still with the great. shutout through three quarters. Quick shout out, though, to Hanson's Brock Tuttle. Great two way player for the Beavers. He gets the stop there. But Hanson simply could not muster any offense on Thursday night. Parkston would add some insurance in the fourth. Coulter Kramer kind of been forgotten about with the injuries, but he's back. Yeah, he's back. He had some phenomenal games early this year. So you got Kramer, you got, you know, so many guys like uh, Jervik and all the you, you got five guys who can run the ball for you and Gage Riker another one of those guys he finishes it off Parkson over Hanson 28 nothing is your final score and Parkson is moving on to the semifinals we heard from the victorious Trojans afterwards it was, it was amazing the atmosphere our fans obviously showed up it was just amazing I mean this is what that's what we're about. We run a wing tee. Mm -hmm. We're smashing smash mouth football. That's what we like to do. And that's what we did tonight. And I think we just proved that we can go play with anyone in the state. We're just confident, focused, ready to go, ready for anything. I mean, I, I'd die for these guys out here. These guys are my brothers. And they, they put in the work, and it's starting to show. Well, part of that is staying healthy, um, being able to kind of have the same guys out on the field, keep rhythm and routine with each other is huge, especially on defense when you got different motions, different people, personal personnel changing, moving around. Um, just very proud. I think defense wins championships. You take pride in your defense and your offense feeds off of it. Um, but like our defense put us in a situation where we could go block a punt. They're deep in their own end zone and uh, just very proud of how our team performed tonight. 6-3 matchup pit Elkton Lake Benton at Howard. First quarter, Taden Hoyer looking for someone. Hey, he just keeps it himself. Tigers take a 7-0 lead, but the Elks would respond. Riddick Wesley into the end zone, and Elkton Lake Benton would take an 8-7 lead. But after that, all Howard. Tate Miller following his blockers into the end zone. 14-8. Slippery conditions wreaking havoc all night for the Elks. Luke Kepsel recovers the fumble. But Howard with some problems of its own. Will Meyer can't get the punt off. Elks back in business, but the Tiger defense holds right here on fourth and goal, so it remains 14-8 at the break. Third quarter, Jackson Remmers back to receive for Howard, eludes one tackle and takes care of the rest. Remmers to the house, 
21-8 Tigers. Remember, this is a Howard team that moved up to 9-AA last year, was undefeated in the regular season, then got upset in the playoffs. They get a playoff win 28-8 over Elkton Lake Benton Jandy. Yeah, just two losses over the last two years for Howard. And after they lost early in the season, he kind of forgot about them. Well, they've worked their way all the way back into the Final Four, and they come in with a charge with this kind of performance against a very physical Elkton Lake Benton team. Yeah, we heard from the Tigers afterwards. Well, I thought we came out and had a really good drive right away, and then, you know, we 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 settled in a little after they scored, and then, they, you know, they had a big run, and we were a little shocked that we gave that up just simply because we practiced against that all week, and, uh, but they caught us, and, and they got, and again, they, hats off to them, really good football team, hit hard, and a lot of young guys out there, but uh, they played great, but then second half, you know, we just talked about a couple of drives we needed, I made a, just a few adjustments or whatever, but, you know, our defense was great, uh, giving up nothing after that, uh, that uh, eight points right away. A goal of ours is always to be physical and hit hard, and I think we did that. We really, we scored right away, and then they came back and took the lead, and we fought back. So that's really what we pride ourselves on, never giving up and always being physical. We knew they were, they were a really good team, coached well. We knew they were gonna have a good game plan. We pointed out some good players of theirs and our coaches did a great job telling us what to do and they put us in good spots and we just do the rest. Prepared well uh, and I thought we executed game plan. We figured it was kind of be something like this, especially with the conditions. We didn't get to throw a lot of passes tonight. Didn't really showcase our passing attack much, but we we grounded out, you know, and, and uh, I think the guys did a great job. I don't know how many yards we had offense, but uh, most of it was on the ground. The defending state champions from Wall traveled to Hamlin in the 5-4 matchup in 9-AA. No score in the second. Eagles strike first. Burt Blasius, Dawson Hancock, 11 yards, 7 nothing Wall. But Hamlin would respond on its ensuing drive. A beautiful ball from Tyson Stevenson to Zach Van Meteren in stride. What a game for Van Meteren. Had made big plays offensively, defensively, and you know they were hungry to go up against Wall, the team that knocked them out of the playoffs last year. Third quarter, Chargers on the move. The pitch to Evan Stormo on the sweep. He'll stumble into the end zone. 14-7 Hamlin. It's a lead they would not relinquish. Next Charger drive, Stevenson, Van Meteren, second touchdown of the night. Yeah, we didn't see a lot of passing on this damp, cool night, but uh, Hamlin seemed to have no problem. And Hamlin knocks off the defending state champions from a wall 28 to 7. As you mentioned, payback from last season's loss to the Eagles in the semifinals. Your other scores from 9AA. Platt get us 34 to 6 over Freeman Mary and Freeman Academy. Black Panthers moving on to the semifinals. They keep improving all year long. Platt Geddes is getting better and better. Erase that early season. They're one of the best teams over the last month. Moving on down to 9A. It is a chilly one in Phillip on Thursday. They hosted Chester in a 9A quarterfinal. Taylor Haynes finds the left edge for the Scotties and just hits the pylon. Phillip with an early 6-0 lead as the students and fans withstanding the freezing rain. It would turn into snow in the second half, but the Phillip offense, well, they would stay hot. Option to Riker Peterson, 26 yards to make it 26 nothing. Chester would hang tough, however, but the reason we show you this upcoming shot, just look at this beauty, this nighttime snowstorm. Love it. Haywald to Joby Wolf for the Chester touchdown, but too little too late. One upset only for the 11 seeded Flyers as the Scotties take this one 46 15 to move on. A team that averages over 50 points per game puts up 46 on a tough Chester team and they get to host a playoff game. Congratulations, Scotties. And we heard from them afterwards. Keep playing. You know, these guys love the sport. They love being out here. You know, they thrived on this weather tonight. It's not very often you get a group of guys. I mean, it would have been easy to just pack up and go home. And, you know, they came out tonight. And, you know, they, they rose to the occasion. They love this kind of weather. They love football, and they love being here. Other scores in 9A, an upset of seven-seeded Dubrook tops Alcester Hudson 14-10, knocking off the previously undefeated Cubs. Yeah, and Dubrook has played one of the tougher schedules, and you forget, you know, they have those few losses on there, but they, they played really well, and they took down the Cubs, the only loss of the year. Moving on, more scores in 9A. Canastota going all Mike McDaniel oh on Gregory. They put up a 70 spot you called, on the defending state champs. You called this one, Dave. I, I was on the gorilla train, and uh, I got bumped off. Look at the Canastota Hawks. Tage Hortman was a monster on Thursday night. 
And your final 9A score, Warner with no problem with Castle with 56 nothing. It was 67-16 in the regular season, 56 nothing in the playoffs. Yeah, and Hunter Kramer, you know, he got through with 100-yard games on the ground. Josiah Baum did as well. Um, a nice, easy, injury-free game for Warner as they prepare to host another semifinal game. Moving on down to Class 9B, we'll just go through the scores here. Potter County with the big upset, 24-20. The 11-seeded Badlers still alive. Two weeks in a row, they go on the road and get a win, and they were able to throw the ball effectively through the air. Landon Larson did, and it came down to the last quarter where the Potter County Badlers took the lead over uh, Course Castigny and got the win. Hitchcock to the defending state champions. They fall to number one Avon 38 to 14. So we will have a new champ in 9B. And it was a Zaya Meyer, just like I thought it would be. That was the difference in the fourth quarter. They really pushed the uh, gas pedal down and took this one with a, a big win. And a couple of shutouts in the bottom half of the bracket. Falkton area, they've been number one in the media poll most of the year. 48-0, no problem with Kadoka area. And then our last one, DeSmith, 42-0 over upset-minded Gayville Vollen. But uh, the Bulldogs, no issue with the Raiders. Yeah, the Bulldogs, they, remember, they're a four seed, but they were ranked you know, one or two most of the season. I think they're one of the teams that you really have to keep an eye on that could claim this 9B title. They're as good as anybody in 9B right now. It's going to be a great semifinal action coming up next week. But when we come back, we will head up to West Fargo and get a breakdown of all the North Dakota quarterfinal action. A bit snowier up north than it is here down south. Varsity Sports Live coming up right after this. Varsity Sports Live, presented by Farmers Union Insurance. Simply different. Varsity Sports Live, presented by South Dakota State University. Build a better future with South Dakota State University. All right, the South Dakota guys had their fun. Carson Zark, Jody Norstead here with you to deliver the fun that we had in North Dakota. Two overtime games, four road teams winning, and that's just eight games of playoffs. We have another eight games tomorrow. This was ridiculous tonight. Yeah, quite the night of the opening round of playoffs. Couple overtime matchups, you know, some upsets here and there in the in the state. I'm excited to get this thing rolling here tonight. Yeah, Horace, big shout out to the Hawks. They get a victory, their first playoff victory, and boy, was it ever dramatic. Double overtime. We'll get to those highlights in a bit, but let's start with the game that you saw right here on Midco Sports. West Fargo and Shanley, oddly enough, deadlocked at 19 wins apiece in the all-time series since 1975. This one would be the tiebreaker. A trip to the semifinals on the line. Shanley's number one offense will came out red hot. Landon Meyer with a five-yard touchdown run. And then Meyer spreading the wealth. He goes to Sam Oshek, and Oshek gets into the end zone. His 19th receiving touchdown, which is just ridiculous. And then he goes to Adam Leininger. Leininger's first touchdown, remember, he's been injured most of the season. He gets in, but this is Meyer's 35th touchdown pass of the year, a new Shanley record, breaking Michael Rosberg's record that he set just last season. Here he helicopters into the end zone. Yeah, Meyer was red hot tonight. He was getting the ball out to his playmakers on time. And as you see here, Leininger with the interception, that was his second of the night. We'll come back here on offense. Leininger going up over two defenders, getting his second touchdown of the game. So Adam Leininger, Jordan Leininger getting in there, and Caden Chrisman getting into the end zone. Just bring up the scoreboard because this one was over at half. 36-0 at half, and it ends up 50-14. to Shanley rolls in this one to move to 10-0. Meyer with two rushing touchdowns, five passing touchdowns. Sam Oshek, a receiving touchdown. He also added an interception. We talked to those two guys after the win. Uh, we kind of came out with that mindset that everybody's a different team in the playoffs, and we can't take anybody lightly because that'll come back to bite us in the rear end. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the cold's going to go for both teams, so it's kind of whoever's going to be tougher and get the better start. And right away, they're kind of getting little things going on offense, and we knew we were going to have to make the most of our offensive drives, and we did that right away. And just getting that lead in the first quarter helped a lot. So who gets the ticket to Shanley next week? Five seed Davies visiting four seed Bismarck, two teams that play solid defense and like to run the ball. Demons won the regular season meeting 22-3 back in September. And they start off well. Carter Henke had a couple of receiving touchdowns in that game. He gets a rushing score here. And then Bismarck recovers a big fumble here. Davies marching in, and they get stopped in a fumble recovery by the Demons. But 
Davies offense starts to pick it up from there. Grant Chosick's going to rip off a nice long run right here. Yeah, Chosick was kind of an X factor on this Davies offense tonight. Zach Lilly's done a lot of the heavy lifting in the regular season, but Chosick here really stepped up on the offensive side of the ball. Second quarter, Davies, that leads to a Gage Brewer touchdown, I should add. Davies up 8-7, then they get a stop on Carter Hinkey on a fourth and one. Davies gets the ball, Gage Brewer, 87-yard touchdown connection to Mr. Chosick again. Davies goes up 15-7, to as you mentioned, playmaker all over the field tonight. And then how about the defense? Andre Work, the big man interception. They snuffed that play out. Yeah, they sure did. The Demons earlier in the season had a few throwback passes to Hankey that got him two touchdowns earlier in the season. Davies was watching the film and got a big interception on the throwback pass. Wayne Wehrmeyer, a heck of a head coach at Davies, and he had a heck of a game plan in this one. Gage Brewer to Grant Chosick. That was on a fourth and five. Did they get the first down? We got a chain gang highlight. <laughs> they did get the first down. And that was with 2.45 left. They end up having the ball for all but about 15 seconds of the final quarter, and Davies wins it. 15 to 7. Eagles go on the road and get a huge victory. They've looked really good since reverting back to that wing T offense. They've now won four of their last five. Here are the Eagles afterwards, not letting up after the Demons got up early. That all came through our senior leadership here. I mean, it would have been really easy to you know, give up and just kind of let the game go, but we didn't, we didn't come into this game. We didn't come to Bismarck to lose. I mean, we got down 7-0, and we, we knew what we had to do, and we did it. And it's, you know, one of those things that, you know, five weeks ago we might have folded, um, but the kids continue to come to work. Kids continue to get better week in, week out. And it's not anything special we're doing as, as a coaching staff. Uh, it's just all about the kids believing in each other and working their butts off. So that'll set up Davies versus Shanley, 25th Street rivalry in the semis. Just 12 hours ago, this field out in Minot was covered in snow. Shout out to the parents and fans coming out to dig them out. First quarter, Magician's first play of scrimmage, Tyson Raziska. Man, Dan had no answer for number two tonight. Yeah, for Minot, you got to lean on the guys that have brought you this far, and Tyson Raziska is that guy for the Magicians. Well, the snowballs flying up into the air. Braves get the ball, and well, they took a, a lot of short gains to march down the field. And then Hudson Sheldon hands it off to Jace Johnson. A little power run in there, ties the game at seven. It stayed that way until the second. Magician's ball, Raziska hits the edge and blows through the snow. Yeah, Tyson Raziska is an explosive back here. Look for him to kind of carry the Magi as this game goes on. Minot 13-7 at that point. Mandan ball with five seconds left in the half on fourth down. Sheldon nearly sacked but stays up, and he's going to hit Tristan Ulmer. Remember, those two connected a couple of times last week in that shootout against Cheyenne. 14-13, Mandan has the lead at the half. Another road team playing well. Braves defense forced Minot to punt to start the third. Then they get a huge turnover here. Anthony Brown with the interception. He had two of them. Yeah, big play for Anthony Brown to get the takeaway, to give the ball back to his offense so Tyson Rosiska could do this. <laughs> Deuce is in the end zone again. Boy, turned it on the Jets. Only needed four yards to get the first down. He chooses touchdown instead. And Minot ends a six-year drought by winning in the playoffs for the first time since 2017. Another big game by Ruziska. 23 to 14 is the final. The Magi improved to 9 and 1 on the season. And who will they play? Cheyenne or Century? It was just last year that Century came to Cheyenne as the 8 seed and stunned the Mustangs in the quarterfinal round. Same two teams tonight in the 7 versus 2 matchup. Patriots deep in Mustang territory on the first drive. Drew Noblin back to pass, scrambles around, but he's brought down a sack from Grant Canodal and Braden Olson. Forces a fourth down, an incomplete pass later, and possession goes to the Mustangs. Cheyenne's march down the field. Caden Olson going to just power right up the middle. Gets in. He had 10 touchdowns last week. He gets a rushing score here. And then after a miscue on the kickoff, Cheyenne gets the ball back. Read option here from Olson, and he was scoring on the ground tonight. Yeah, he sure was. We obviously know what he can do with his arm through the air, but tonight in the cold weather, Olson powering the offense in the run game, getting six total touchdowns and a big Cheyenne win. So that means 16 touchdowns over the last two games for Caden Olson. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. We're seeing what Landon Meyer's doing in, in Shanley, but not so fast, football fans. Caden Olson is showing what he can do at the quarterback position as well. So now they will play Minot. They will host Minot next week in the semis. Cheyenne beat Minot 28-20 back in late September. Let's see if the sequel lives up to the original. Well, let's go to two-way. Milestone night for West Fargo Horace, making their playoff debut against Dickinson. First score of the game of the second quarter, Taylor Stefano. It's to Gavin Olson, 27-yard score. Hawks up 6-0. Third quarter, Horace forced to punt. 
but he can't get the attempt off. He tries to run for the first down, but fumbles, and this ball is going to get picked up by Dickinson. The midgets are going back the other way, and this is how Dickinson gets its only points of regulation. That ties it up at 6-6. Six, six. Yeah, just when you think you're going to pull off a, an immaculate play by getting the first down on the punt, you fumble and give the ball back to Dickinson on an incredible 63-yard scoop and score. No score in the fourth. We're going to overtime. Horace has the first chance. Ty Garai scores by running over some defenders. They have the two-pointer. They go up 14-6. to six. One last chance here for Dickinson. Steven Zawadny is going to scramble and run it in himself to make it 14-12. to 12. Watch this play. Zawadny just using his legs here, Cars. Yeah, Zawadny literally scrambles outside the pocket on a third and seven, able to get into six, in for six and extend this ball game. So now they need two to tie. Zawadny keeps it, and it's good. We're tied at 14. So we go to double overtime in a quarterfinal game. And for Horace, their first playoff game. They get a stop, and then on offense, Garay delivers the walk-off winner. Or no, excuse me, I think that's the stop. And now here comes Second overtime, Horace gets a stop. That was the stop. And then on offense, Garay, there's your walk-off winner. That was Horace getting the stop before the touchdown. Horace makes the 280-mile trek well worth it. In just their second varsity season, they win their first playoff game, 20-14 to in the final. Can you imagine the buzz on that bus ride back home? Yeah, it makes the 280-mile the trip home a whole lot sweeter, picking up your first playoff win in school history, driving all that way to Dickinson, Got to feel good for the Horace Hawks. The top ranked Fargo North Spartans trying to remain perfect, hosting Valley City, who lost four straight to finish the regular season. This is tonight's only game that wasn't a rematch from the regular season. Spartans rumbling in for six first. Peter Haugo, guess who? Touchdown North. And then Valley City gets the ball, and all oh, the handoff is botched, and you can't afford mistakes like this when you're playing the Spartans. Yeah, you sure can't, and you, you turn the ball over like that early, the Spartans will make you pay. Ethan Welk on the option, keeps it. He's into the end zone, makes it 14-0. Then it's back to Haugo, and uh, he shows what his stiff arm can do. And Valley City's a physical team, but no match for Mr. Haugo. Yeah, he's doing his best Derrick Henry impression. Not one stiff arm, two stiff arms, able to get in the end zone and an easy win for those Spartans. North's all-time leading rusher continues to rumble all over the field. They'll be at home again next week against Horace, a 41-7 victory tonight. And uh, they beat Horace earlier in the season, 42-0, all the way back on August 18th, and the Hawks have definitely been a different team since. How about the two-seed Fargo South hunting for a playoff victory over upset-minded Grand Forks Central? The Knights grab an 8-3 lead in the first, but Demarion Semenko changes that in a hurry, gets the handoff, finds a crease, and he's gone. 67 yards. semenko has been fun to watch. Yeah, he sure has. He was running hard on this play, and you really thought Semenko would be the one to kind of bury him over that hump and kind of carry that Bruins offense tonight. He got dinged up, though, in this game, but Central takes over, grabs all the momentum here. Jack Simmers, a quarterback. Well, quarterback just did that. Yeah, that's what you like to see out of your quarterback, showing the toughness to plow through defenders on short yardage goal line situations. 14-10 Knights, biggest play of the game here. Brevin Work hit as he throws. No whistle by the officials on the play, and central defensive back Tyler Wallen tracks down the loose ball, scoops it up, and the play continues. He returns it all the way for a touchdown here. Yeah, that's why you play, play till the whistle, Jody. No one blew the whistle. The defense kept playing, and they ended up getting another scoop and score here for a six. Yeah, Tyler Colesel trying to say that Wark's arm was going forward. Knights had all the momentum. Next Bruin drive on third and long. Wark airs it out, but it's picked out by Leo Strandell. Fargo South had four first-half turnovers overall and could not recover. Knights just kept the hammer down. With less than a minute left in the half, Simmers goes up top. Trey Coots in the corner of the end zone. Yeah, when it rains, it pours. You start turning the ball over, you start giving Central some momentum, and they really ran with it. 28-10, they're up at the half on the road. Semenko sidelined with that shoulder injury. He'd watch the Knights pull away in the third quarter. Simmers again on the QB run. Man, he has had a tremendous season, since, especially since switching to that quarterback spot. He scores from 24 yards out. Central wins its first quarterfinal game since 2005. That's the year they won the state title as well, 42-10. Boy, that Knights team, pretty impressive in this one. Let's hear from the coach and the kid, Jack Simmers, afterward. 
Yeah, it means a lot. You know, our seniors are good leaders. They've done a good job buying in from the jump. You know, it's never easy when you come in and, you know, you got a new guy kind of telling you what to do and changing things that have been happening. But uh, the kids are great about buying in. Our assistant coaches are some of the best in the state. We played them, I think, third game of the year. We're just a completely different team. They came out, they smacked us in the mouth right at the first game. And we just came in knowing that we're a different team and we can compete with anybody. Jake Shower give him a lot of credit. Second year as a head coach, and he has him in the semis. Jamestown and Red River rematch from earlier in the season. Rough Riders won that meeting. Ryan Kalmbach somehow keeps this play alive. Finds Tyson Jorison in the end zone. 21-14 with 10-20 left in the game. Pierce Barks then hits Hayden Hong on a crossing route. That's with 6-22 left. It's tied at 21. This isn't a replay coming up here, Carson. Same route. Hayden Hong again makes it 28-21 with one minute left. Yeah, they couldn't stop it on that first time, just running that little shallow crossing pattern. They hit it again for two touchdowns in a row. But Jamestown isn't done. After a quick drive down the field, they get a 16-yard touchdown. Tyson Jorison again. We're tied at 28 with just 36 seconds left. Overtime, we go. Jamestown's going to get the ball first. And who else do you think they give it to than Jorison, who is their main man all night. He's going to score from six yards out. There you see uh, the lead up to overtime. And Jorison, nice run here. Yeah, Jorison coming back from injury was a big factor in this game. Remember, didn't play the last regular season game of the year. You're right. We had that one right here on Midco Sports. 35-28. Red River's turn. Thomas Kraft punches it in, makes it 35-34. Red River opts to go for two. Gutsy call for Vern Mears Group. Parks goes to the end zone here. But they rule the receiver out of bounds. The catch, no, the catch was good, but it was out of bounds. And Jamestown pulls out the road win. All those road teams getting that money tonight. Blue Jays win their seventh straight playoff game. Of course, back-to-back -back state champs. Bill Nelson just knows how to coach in the postseason, doesn't he? 35-34 victory. Jamestown now gets to host a semifinal. How about that? Because the Central's upset over South, so it'll be the Knights heading to Jamestown next week. My friend, we have the matchups, and uh, we'll stick with Class 2A right now. North and Horace in one semifinal, Grand Forks Central and Jamestown in the other semifinal. We have the five, six, and seven seeds all in to the postseason uh, Final Four uh, in Class 2A. What do you think about that? Yeah. You think, is it Norse to lose, especially now that you have all these upsets? Yeah, I mean, obviously North is going to be the favorite, you know, getting a big, easy, you know, easy win tonight against Valley City. But you throw other teams in the mix like Central, Jamestown, teams that, you know, have proven that they can compete against North. They played them tough, you know, when they played in the regular season this year. But, I mean, I, I got to say it is North to lose at the end of the day because they've really shown, you know, towards the end of the season and then early in the playoffs in tonight's game that they really are a juggernaut in 2A. The other matchups in uh, Class 3A, Shanley, I don't know if they wanted to see Davies, a team that's very familiar with them and a team that's playing red hot right now. Yeah, th that's, that's kind of what, you know, the Davies coach said, um, the, the interview that they did with the player there. They've gotten hot at the right time. If they, you would ask them five weeks ago, you know, how, yeah. they'd, how they'd feel about responding in some of these games, they might have had a different answer. So they seem to have found something, you know, down in South Fargo for the Eagles that, you know, Shanley – is going to have to play their best football, and it's in the semifinals. Anything can happen. So we saw it last year with Century. It could happen again this year with Davies pulling off in a big upset. So no matter what, Chandler's going to have to come ready and play their best ball. And Minot's already played Cheyenne on the road. It was a 28-20 to victory by Cheyenne, but uh, Minot's not going to be afraid going into the Mustangs uh, home. But uh, two different contrasting styles. Cheyenne likes to open it up a little bit. Minot likes to keep it on the ground a little. Yeah, definitely different styles of football. And Cheyenne's kind of struggled to run the ball at times. So if we get some inclement weather where Cheyenne has to air it out, it's anybody's ball game. And we know how good, how good and stingy that Minot defense is. There you go. We got our final four set in class 3A and 2A. We got a preview coming up next, though, of tomorrow's action in class A and 9, man. That's next on Minko Sports. Varsity Sports Live, presented by Farmers Union Insurance. Simply different. Welcome back to Varsity Sports Live, and welcome back to these two high school sports broadcasting savants. Brad Anderson from 1039 The Truck, Chase Miller from Your Live Event, back with us to break down Saturday's slate of games in the Class A and Nine Man quarterfinal round. Last week we saw two road teams win in the opening round of the Class A postseason. Kildeer stole a one point win at Deluxe Burlington, and Oaks knocked off Carrington on the road. 
Will we see any road teams win this week? Here are the matchups. Defending state champ Velva Drake Animus Garrison hosts Shiloh Christian. Trinity draws Kildeer. Opes heads to two seed Kindred. And three seed Langdon Edmore Munich hosts Central Cass. Brad, which road team has the best shot at an upset? Well, I'd say I like the both Region 1 teams to maybe have a shot, but I would say Central Cass just because, you know, it's that recipe of, you know, last year Tommy Butler talked about how this offense traveled. Well, it's going to have to travel. Although I did see Langdon attempting. I got a photo earlier in the week saying they were going to put a tarp on the field. They were attempting to do it the other night to try and make it a, as dry a track as they possibly can because they're going to be right in that bullseye for some snow. But, you know, the way Central Cast ran the ball last week uh, really established things early on. And then defensively, defensively they have been outstanding. What, 21 points they've given up in the last in the eight-game winning streak. But they haven't seen an offense like this yet. So. Yeah, and just the pedigree of what Josh Kravarska yes. has built up there. It's been such a successful program. Uh, year in and year out. Chase, who else should be a little nervous out of the four seeded teams? Yeah, you, you say if Shiloh starts early, Velva might be in for a four-quarter game like they were against Bowman County. You say Kildare only lost by 11 to Trinity, so second time around. And anytime you talk with football coaches, they say we never want to see a region mm -hmm. opponent again in the playoffs, which makes me go Oaks and Kindred because that's a hard-hitting game. It was 21 nothing down in Oaks earlier this season. Also, uh, the Oaks Tornadoes get a really good senior uh, back again in Mr. Marcus Scar who had the game-ending interception in Carrington, talking with Greg Dobitz earlier in the week. This was a guy that didn't come out for football because he had back-to-back -back injuries his sophomore and junior mm -hmm. year, didn't want to get any more injured. Then all of a sudden, a couple weeks into the season, saying, Coach, I want to play. So if Oaks can have a matching score for a matching score against Kindred and not get down by two scores mm -hmm. against that big, brutal offense and defensive line for the Vikings, Oaks could make it a little more interesting, just like last year when the Squirrels beat the Vikings in this quarterfinal round match. Yeah, this time of year, things can get tricky. One thing that'll be interesting, how do the cold temperatures impact the Trinity and Kildeer matchup? Like you mentioned, the game is scheduled for a 7.30 Central Time start due to it being a doubleheader at, uh, out in Dickinson. Dickinson State plays Waldorf in the afternoon. It's going to be probably 10 to 15 degrees at kickoff. It should be relatively calm, though. No snow in the forecast. Titans won the regular season game 33-22 to in mid-September. Kildeer figured some things out in the second half, fought their way back into it. But this feels like a game where the Titans maybe ride their All-State running back, Ty Dassinger, and pick their spots with the passing game, Jace Kovash and company. For the Cowboys, look out for senior rusher and linebacker Gus Bomback. Had a big game last week. One last thing, Kildeer 8-2 right now. Their two losses to Trinity and Shiloh, two teams that are still playing football uh, right now. Let's get over to Nine Man, where the big story coming out of last week happened in Gwinter, where Nelson County pulled off a monumental upset by knocking off top-seeded and unbeaten Sargent County 30-29. to Nobody had come within 30 points of the Bulldogs all year. How do the Chargers do it, Chase? I think right now, with what, if you're a Nelson County fan, you got to do what you did against a Sargent County, right? You have to have extra possessions, find a way to create a turnover, maybe something on special teams play that we saw with that block field goal at the end of the game. So if you can get a special teams play, if you can get an interception, um, also the closest regular season for North Prairie outside of their one loss in Rockford Cheyenne was a 20-point win against the Chargers. And again, just in the regular season. So Nelson County is not going to be obviously afraid of North Prairie seeing them in the regular season. They have some similarities and familiarity. There, there's always two schools of thought on that. It's one, it's familiarity. Maybe you don't have to look at so much and it's familiarity. We got to really be a little bit more concerned, kind of like with the Oaks Kindred game. Um, I'd imagine with the weather, what it, potentially what it might be, might be snow. I think you're going to see a lot of that ground attack and, and I can't imagine North Prairie is going to venture away from that, especially with the weather, because that's that's type of offense I can travel in a, in a playoff format. Chase, I know you've seen Lamore, Litchville, Marion a number of times. What's the key for them to get a win at New Rockford, Cheyenne, Matter? Well, I'll take a old uh, Andy Delabar playbook here, the Swiss Army knife of Gunnar Thielgis. I mean, he catches, he throws, and he runs. That's a triple play, I think, <laughs> at the end of the day. And Max Musling, he can he can run on the outside. He's a big, tall 6'3", 6'4", matchup with a corner. He can pass the ball as well. They got two really good uh, linemen up front with Ryder Wendell and Tucker Jones who do a lot of the dirty work mm -hmm. defensively, let those linebackers come in and, and fill the void. So if you're a Lamorta Litchfield, 
Marion, this is a team where you looked at their roster the last three years, had a lot of Colton Nesses, had a lot of yep. Keebles of the world. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden, everyone else who was second string or playing JV, so to speak, this is their opportunity, and I think they want to put their own thumbprint on nine-man football because if they win, they might not be a nine-man for long. That's a story for another day. <laughs> but for the for the Rockets, impressive what they've done this year. Easton Simon, uh, what he's done at the quarterback spot. Connor Natter, this is a, a very speedy team that Elliott Belquist has, uh, and they are undefeated for a reason. They beat North Prairie earlier this year. If you want to go to a game where you're guaranteed to see the most offensive highlights, I'd say find your way to West Hope on Saturday. <laughs> Junior QB Walker Broughton leads the Sioux against senior QB Javin Freeze and Grant County Flasher. Both are locks to be first team all state. How do you see this one playing out, Brad? Oh, boy, be a lot of points. Yeah. You know, and we'll see how much the weather plays a factor in this. I don't know if it will, though. I think with these guys, the way that they are especially brought in the way that he's a almost a double and triple threat you know I think that they can switch and run the ball and do just fine so I, I, I don't know if the weather's going to play a whole lot of a factor in that I still think it'll be a lot of points and uh, and if there's one maybe potential upset Grant County Grant County Flasher's been they've knocked on the door a few times maybe this is their year to make a make a run kind of like we've talked about with North Prairie in the, the other half of the bracket both so. those quarterbacks six touchdowns last week the two programs have only played twice that was back in the back-to-back uh, -back postseasons in 2013 and 14, which they split. The Hedinger County rematch with South Border, that one's intriguing because the Huskies' only loss since August has been to the Mustangs, albeit in blowout fashion, 55-18. On the other hand, the Mustangs have been beating the snot out of teams every week. Berkeley, France, sophomore QB playing lights out. The Huskies must find a way to force some turnovers to hang around in that one. That'll do it for our quarterfinal preview. Next week, we'll be talking about tickets to the Dakota Bowl up for grabs. Stick around. We'll wrap up Varsity Sports Live with some final thoughts after this. Varsity Sports Live, presented by South Dakota State University. Build a better future with South Dakota State University. Two quick things. Big showdown tomorrow. South Dakota State and South Dakota pregame at 12.30. Kickoff after one. And Jandy and I will break down all the South Dakota semifinals next week on Football Insiders on our social media channels. For Jody Carson and Jandy, I'm Brownie. Good night.